the dead of Druster. Druster dismissed the guards guarding the Duchess's room. He opened the door without knocking. Druster found Aldridar sitting on the ottoman in front of the bed, the bed was with the covers aside. A set of candles, the only source of light, rose unevenly from an iron stand that was barely visible in the shadows of the room. She was in bed, she heard me approaching and she's moved to the chair, Druster thought. What do you want? Aldridar asked aloud and with remarkable abruptness. Druster, as if he hadn't heard her, continued slowly forward. Aldridar did not insist. When the Duke was closer to her, he began to speak in a voice so weak that Aldridar turned to see him better. I remember with joy the day you arrived. Your eyes shone with a special radiance. You entered all the rooms, in all the halls, you walked through all the corridors, you greeted all the servants, all the cooks. You were smiling. You looked very happy. And so was I. Aldridar knitted her brows at him and looked away without saying anything. Do you remember that with the help of Douglas I built a boat for two people? Druster continued in the same dull tone. I have always loved ships since my father took me to the shipyards in the port and I was able to see how they built a warship. Aldridar remained unaltered. I remember that we launched my small boat into the waters of the river for the first time during the autumn festivities, before paying the peasants their salary after the harvest and before new jobs were distributed among the De Laboris. Druster stopped her words for a moment. Then he added. But you never came to see my ship. Neither at the opening nor after. Aldridar raised her back as if someone had grazed her spine. Unfortunately, Aldridar answered, the celebrations of San Miguel occur at the same time. I couldn't leave the church. The nuns, the altar boys, and I spent the whole afternoon praying. It is important to show our devotion as lords of these lands. If showing your devotion was so important, Druster said with some difficulty, why did you miss the other ceremonies of the church when you wanted to? Well, Aldridar replied briskly because a duchess has more than one obligation. Druster had arrived in front of the couch where Aldridar was sitting. He was motionless for a few moments. Then, he held his knees as if to support them. Slowly, he bent down until he was on his knees in front of his duchess. Aldridar looked at him in surprise but she very quickly turned her eyes away from her husband. Drust remained kneeling like that. He did nothing but look at the ground and touch his knees. Aldridar looked at him twice for a few seconds out of the corner of her eye. Do you remember how my son loved you at first? Druster asked, gasping for breath as if he was missing it. Aldridar stiffened more than ever. A long silence passed between the two of them until Druster said. Could you move my legs for me so I can lie on the ground? Aldridar turned to see Druster surprised. Why can't you do it by yourself? She replied, frowning. Because because I can't feel my legs anymore, Druster answered. Aldridar opened her eyes like never before. She was livid in a second. She raised her hands and extended her fingers as she shouted. What have you done? Aldridar lunged to the ground and carefully she did as the Duke had asked. Her right leg first. Druster's body turned accordingly. Then the other leg. Aldridar put a hand on Druster's back, another on her chest, and she gently lowered him to the ground. Oh, my God, exclaimed Aldridar sobbing, 
How could you be capable of this? Aldrida raised her husband's thorax again, slid her legs under it, and placed the duke's back on them. Aldrida looked at Druster's pale face and lifting his chest against hers, she yelled at him. But why did you do it? Druster who was half gone, answered with difficulty. My son my poor son. My brother. Aldrida hugged him tightly. Druster, staring into space, asked. Why did you never love me? Aldrida let her tears fall freely but she didn't answer anything. She was crying without screaming. A few seconds later, Druster's body shook in a final tremor and, with her last breath, he barely managed to complete the question. Why? Why? Aldrida burst into tears. Her tears bathed the face of her husband. She stayed like that for a long time, sobbing over the dead man. The rain outside threatened to enter. The candle seemed to tremble with each cry and with it all the darkness throbbed. Slowly, Aldrida calmed down, she soothed herself until she showed no activity, and so she remained frozen in the room. Aldrida had her chest against the dead man's chest. In frightening corroboration, the woman could feel only her own pulse at the sight of contact. One of her hands was holding with difficulty the weight of the corpse from one of her armpits. In her fingers, Aldrida could already feel the coldness with which death marks her territory. At some point, Aldrida opened her eyes. She looked down at her lying husband with less pain than compassion, without the stupor or despair of those who feel their loss as irreplaceable. Circumspect, perhaps even moved, the woman only looked straight down, avoiding her right for the risk of finding the glance that her husband could be directing at her from beyond the grave. The Duchess's ever marble countenance lay in midair, too, dangling, distanced from the dead man's calm, relieved expression, oblivious to her departure as much as he was alien to his existence. The corpse, on the other hand, seemed never to have been more comfortable, better held, better embraced, better loved. His head, thrown back seemed more abandoned in a lethargic pleasure than pushed down by the claim of gravity. There was serenity and relief on his face. One arm dangled, collapsed on the floor. The man seemed to have died clutching his fingers to one of the many folds of vaporous nightwear that piled on top of each other like a floating waterfall that had been frozen at the last second. There was intimacy in the woman's lost gaze, but she had no anguish. Aldrida finally finished straightening her head. She now had her eyes directed forward, towards the candles. The yellowish light from the wax travelled toward the couple, pushing the darkness aside. The two bulges rested on the floor forming an imaginary and shining triangle with a pyramidal balance. With blonde brush strokes, the waxy light discovered the forms hidden by the darkness, it didn't illuminate completely but it lit up the skin either reddening the tissues where the light fades, or splashing gold where the rays touch the temple. As soon as the candles faltered, the shadows, crouched to the sides, recovered volumes for the domains of the dark nothingness. To the rhythm of the heartbeat of the flames, the tide of shadows climbed over the banks of the motionless couple, in a pulsating swing that now illuminated them, now constantly extinguished them, drowning them in their impenetrable blindness. The colors that reveal the features of the skin folded in the contours and plunged into the void of depth. The reds sank, the ochres, outstanding, whitened. Foreheads rekindle, necks languished. The eyes cleared with sharp highlights, the ears faded, blurred, 
and the faults, were erased. Once up, Aldridar's face, painted with honey, got rid of the roundness that her hanging skin had accumulated, falsifying a tenuous and transient smoothness. On his cheekbones, the hardness reappeared, her nose restored her edge. Her face became angular again, like a diamond cut. Her eyes weren't crying anymore but they were wet with amber splendor. Her gaze, belligerent again, now gleamed with greed. Why, Aldridar says to the air, you ask me why? Aldridar was silent for a few moments. The dying candles burned her wicks and she heard the crackles. The rain that had not stopped falling had become deafening. Well, because I can, she exclaimed with a sigh. Saying that, Aldridar suddenly released Druster's weight as she spread her legs wide. The Duke's head bounced against the ground. The Duchess got up in the Arca gloom, adjusted her dress, and left Druster at the mercy of the darkness, alone, as he had been all his life.